bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. and we try our best to prove it. Is today your first time here? Maybe your first time in a while. Maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, our vision is to be a place where people can freely worship God, connect with an authentic community of believers, spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, impact our community, and fervently study the word of God. Our guide is the Bible because it is the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope that you will see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it is our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're with us today. And we hope that you will join us on our journey following Christ and living out his plan for us. So again, welcome to Mount Olive Church. nothing worth more that will ever come close nothing can compare you are living home your presence Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and feel the tasted and seen of the sweetest of lives when my heart becomes free and 
when my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. today, Jesus. Hallelujah. Our God is worthy of all the honor and all the praise that we can give him. Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 15. Pretty familiar passage of scripture. I'll be reading this morning from the New American Standard Bible. I'll be reading verses 1 through 4. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. And it reads like this. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. I want to underscore verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to to the scriptures and that he was buried according to the scriptures that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures Christ died for our sins he was buried and he was raised on the third day all according to 
the scriptures. For a few moments, with your prayers and with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to preach from the subject, the good news for bad times. The good news for bad times. Tell somebody there's good news for bad times. My brothers and sisters, it has been said that confession is good for the soul. And then someone else came along and said confession is good for the soul, but it's bad for the reputation. But today I'm going to take a risk because I have a confession to make. And my confession today is that after Tuesday's presidential debate, I wanted both a cigarette and a strong drink. Yeah, I know. Don't judge me. Don't look at me funny because I know I'm not by myself. I said after Tuesday's presidential debate, I needed a Newport, a Camel, a Winston, Salem, whatever the case may be. I needed both a cigarette and a strong drink. I mean, I felt every negative emotion possible. I went from embarrassment to disappointment to anger to utter disbelief. From the back and forth of what sounded like two elementary school children to the name calling to the refusal to denounce white supremacy by a sitting president. My wife kept looking at me and saying, baby, this is bad. This is really bad. And while she shook her head, I, I, I thought about it. It's not just the presidential debate that's bad. It's, it's cops being able to kill an unarmed black woman in cold blood while attempting to serve a no-knock warrant and only being held responsible for the damage done to the neighbor's wall, ending with a piece of property receiving more justice than a black woman. That's bad. It, it, it is folks who claim to be pro-life and who are fighting to protect the lives of the unborn but won't fight for babies being separated from their parents and held in cages at the border. It's bad. It's hundreds of thousands of lives being lost to coronavirus. It's violence in and around urban communities. It's economic downfall. It all seems bad. And my brothers and sisters, I felt down this week. I felt depressed this week because as a pastor, you want to offer hope. But this week, I felt like Shaka Khan and Rufus. I needed somebody to tell me something good. And that's when I stumbled upon our text today and discovered that even though the times are bad, there is still good news for the bad times. Would you tell somebody there's still good news for bad times? Come on, tell somebody else. There's still good news for bad times. You ought to type it in the comment section. You ought to send somebody a text message. Remind somebody, in spite of everything that's going on, in spite of what's happening in and around us, there is still good news for bad times. And that's the point of our text today and our point of preachment here in the 15th chapter of Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Paul writes this letter, which is one of four letters he wrote in response to letters written to him by the elders in the church at Corinth. All in all, Paul writes uh, this letter to identify problems in the Christian church, to offer solutions and to teach believers how to live for Christ in a corrupt society. Let me say that again. Paul writes to identify problems in the Corinthian church, to offer solutions, and to teach believers how to live for Christ in a corrupt society. And if there was ever a time where believers needed to learn how to live for Christ, in a corrupt society, the time is now. In his commentary on 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Chuck Swindoll notes that up until this 15th chapter, 
Paul has primarily addressed the church's errors with orthopraxy. Uh, orthopraxy is the study of right practice. Uh, you see, the, Corinth the Corinthian church had failed to live up to the Christian virtues of love, unity, peace, morality, and humility that often should have been the character of a growing spirit-filled believer's. In other words, the Corinthian church, they were, they were church folks who knew what to do, but didn't know how to carry it out. But in this 15th chapter, Paul makes this sudden transition from serious issues of orthopraxy or serious issues of right practice to the severe issue of orthodoxy. He moves from orthopraxy to orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is right doctrine. So he moves from how they acted to what they believed. And he shifts here in this 15th chapter to talk about right doctrine. Some scholars call this letter the theological summit of Paul's letter and that he begins with an emphasis on what is of first importance in verse 3. Look at what Paul says. Let's go to verse 1. He says, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive in which you also stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. In other words, he said, let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the gospel that I preach to you before you welcome it then and you still are standing firm in it he says it is this gospel that saves you if you continue to believe the message that I told you unless what you believed in the first place was untrue so he says, if you truly believe the gospel that I preach to you, if you truly believe the gospel that I talk to you, you need to be able to stand firm in that gospel because it's that gospel that saves you. We always have been taught that the gospel is the good news, but the English term gospel comes from the Middle English compound, good spell. So the word is literally good spell, where spell means tell. So the gospel is a good tale or a good story. The Greek term for the word gospel uh, described a favorable report of a messenger from the battlefield. Let me say that again. Again, that Greek word literally means the gospel is a favorable report of a messenger from the battlefield. So even though war is bad, a favorable report from a messenger from the battlefield offered good news in the middle of a bad time. Let me say that again. War is bad, but this favorable report from the messenger from the battlefield offers good news in the middle of the bad time. And this good news that Paul proclaimed concern Jesus Christ's death for sin and his resurrection as well as salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone and that is why this summarization of the gospel message or this summarization of the gospel message here uh, scholars call it the sides doctrine or the seat of doctrine. It's the very core. It's the very essence of what we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is the very essence of what we as Christians actually believe. Paul goes on to say in verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is to say that I, I pass on to you what was most important and what also had been passed on to me. Paul says that Christ 
died for our sins, just as the scripture said. Christ was buried just as the scripture says. Christ was raised from the grave on the third day, just as as the scriptures had said. And this, my brothers and sisters, is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what every Christian, every Christian faith should be built upon, that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he died for our sins, just like the scripture said, that he was buried, just like the scripture said, that he was raised on the third day, just like the scripture says, this is what every Christian and believer should build their faith on and this is what every church that calls themselves a Christian church should be built up on tell somebody this is good news this is the gospel the fact that Jesus died for our sins as the scriptures already said in the Old Testament the fact that Jesus was buried as the scripture said the fact that Jesus was raised from the grave on the third day this is the foundation of what we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ should embrace should Christians and churches be active in their community? Absolutely. Should Christians and churches teach and encourage financial literacy? Absolutely. Should Christians and churches empower people to be their best self? Absolutely. But Christians and churches should not build their faith around community activism. Christians and churches should not build their faith around financial literacy. Christians and churches should not build their faith around individual empowerment while all those things are good while all those things are byproducts of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ the very thing that we have to hold on to the very thing that we have to build our lives our faith and our church upon is the gospel of Jesus Christ what am I trying to say at its core a healthy Christian and a healthy Christian church preaches and teaches that Jesus Christ is God the son who died for our sins and was raised from the grave and that his death was the necessary atonement for our sins I know that was a lot so I'll rewind the tape and I'll press play one more time if you don't remember anything else I say if you don't remember anything else I speak the rest of this sermon remember this a healthy Christian, a healthy Christian church preaches and teaches that Jesus Christ is God, that Jesus Christ was God the Son who died for our sins and that he was raised from the grave and that his death was the necessary atonement for our sins. I know we got a lot of churches out there preaching a whole lot of stuff. They want you to live your best life now. They want you to be your best self now. But the truth of the matter is you can't live your best life if you're not building your life up on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is Christ the Son of the living God. You can't build your best life if you're not building up on the fact that he died for your sins. You can't build your life if you're not building it on the fact that he rose for your justification. Tell somebody, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the good news. Was Jesus a prophet? Yes, he was a prophet. Was Jesus a great teacher? Yes, he was a great teacher. Did Jesus teach great principles? Yes, he taught great principles. But here's the deal, y'all. There is no salvific power in Jesus being a prophet. There is no salvific power in Jesus being a great teacher. There is no salvific power in Jesus being a miracle worker. All of these things are great, but none of these attributes have the power to save us. We got a lot of churches as we begin this new sermon series talking about the DNA of a healthy church. We have a lot of churches that build their church on a lot of things. Some churches build their church on tradition. 
They look back 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and even 100 years. They look back years and years to see what we used to do back then and how we used to do it back then. But if what you did back then was not birthed on the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died, that he was buried, and he was resurrected, you need to do away with it. Churches are building upon tradition. Churches are building upon what's popular. Churches are building upon fads. They want to be popular. They want to be in the in crowd. They want to be relevant. But you can't build upon what's relevant. You can't build upon what's historical. You need to build your church on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's my message today. That a healthy Christian church preaches and teaches that Jesus Christ is God. That Jesus Christ is God the Son. That Jesus Christ died for our sins and that he was raised from the grave and that his death was the necessary atonement for our sins. I know some of us think that we're all that in a bag of chips. I know some of us don't believe that our sins were that bad. I know that some of us don't believe that we're that bad of a person. But can I tell you something? Even on your best day, you still pale in comparison to what God expects from us. That's why the Bible says that and our righteousness is as a filthy rags unto God. In other words, you need the blood of Jesus. You need the sacrifice of Jesus. You need what God did by sending Jesus to die for your sins. He said, there is no salvific power. I love the fact that Jesus was a prophet. And many recognize that Jesus was a prophet. Even our, our Muslim brothers and sisters recognize Jesus as a prophet. But he wasn't just a prophet. And if you want to be honest about it, for some of our Muslim brothers who say that Jesus Christ was a prophet, even if you look in the Quran, the Quran says that a true prophet cannot lie. So if Jesus was a prophet and a true prophet cannot lie, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light, that no man comes to the Father except they come by me. That's what we build our faith on, that Jesus Christ is is God, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that Jesus Christ was buried in the grave, that Jesus Christ rose for our justification just as the scripture has said, and that's good news. Again, Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was a great teacher. Jesus taught some great principles. Jesus worked some miracles, but there is no salvific power in Jesus being a prophet. There's no salvific power in Jesus being a great teacher. There's no salvific power in Jesus being a miracle worker. Do I need a miracle? Yes, I need a miracle. Do I need him to speak into my life? Yes, I need him to speak. Do I need to be taught by Jesus? Yes, I need to be taught by him. But none of these attributes have the power to save us. And that's why the songwriter asked the question, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again. Nothing but the beloved of Jesus. Then he said, oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount. I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. I wish you would high five somebody and tell them nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And my brothers and sisters, that's good news for bad times. I know things are looking shaky in our country right now. But that's good news for bad times. I'm in my seat, but Paul says that Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he said he was buried. Just as the scripture said, he said he was raised from the dead. Just as the scripture said, on the third day, I wish you would tell somebody he died. Just as the scripture said, the old preacher would say, didn't he die? Tell somebody he died. Just as the scripture has said, I said he died until the sun refused to shine. 
I said he died until the earth rocked and rimbled like a drunken man. I said he died until the centurion soldier said surely this must have been the son of God. Would you touch your neighbor and tell somebody he died just as the scripture has said. But then not only did he die, but he was buried in a borrowed tomb. The reason why the tomb was borrowed is because anytime you borrow something, the plan is to eventually give it back. I said, let me say that one more time. I said, anytime you borrow something, the plan is to eventually give it back. So Jesus, Airbnb's a tomb and he reserves it for just two nights. He goes to hell. He preaches a revival. He takes the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And then early Sunday morning, he checks out of the tomb. I said early Sunday morning, he checks out of the tomb. Y'all know I'm Baptist. I can't just say it at one time. I said early Sunday morning, he checked out of the tomb and he got up from the grave with all power in his hand. And I came to tell somebody that that's good news in a bad time. As crazy as things are right now, that's good news in a bad time. Would you tell somebody there's still good news in a bad time? And because that's good news, I can sing the song because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone and life is worth a living just because he lives. Would you throw your arms around your neighbor? I said throw your arms around your neighbor. I said throw your arms around your neighbor and tell a neighbor life is worth a living just because he lived. Sally, 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 that's good news. Sally, that's good news. Sally, 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 yeah, Sally, yeah. That's good news for a bad time. And that good news is that Jesus is still God. That Jesus is still on the throne. Don't you worry about who the president is. Because guess what? The president still has a term limit. So that means eventually whoever gets elected they gonna be out of office but Jesus has no term limits he shall reign forever he is God forever he sits high and he looks low I said he shall reign forever and never and never tell somebody he's gonna reign forever I feel the Holy Ghost I said he's gonna reign forever and that's good news i said that's good news shelly yeah shelly yeah shelly yeah shelly yeah shelly yeah shelly yeah churches hang our hats on the good news of Jesus Christ that's what we do we hang our hats on the good news of Jesus Christ 
If you hang your hat on anything else, you'll be frustrated. You'll be irritated. If you place your hope in anything else, it'll let you down. But the good news is always dependable. And that's what we place our trust and our faith in. Listen, if you're watching with us this morning and you have yet to receive this good news, I know this is bad time. But if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, who is Jesus? Jesus is God the Son. I know oftentimes people say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But sometimes that language gets confusing because it lends to the belief that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are three separate individuals when they're actually one individual expressed in three different ways. So there's God, the Creator, so God is God, Yahweh. And then you have Jesus who is God. The Son. And then you have the Holy Spirit, which is God. The Comforter. If you have yet to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Who died. Who was the atonement for our sin have yet to believe that, I want to extend an invitation to you today. I want to extend an invitation to you. If you're here, you're watching with us live, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you haven't confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you haven't made him Lord over your life, I want to extend an invitation for you to do that now. Type it in the comment section. Shoot me an email. My email address is going to be on the bottom of the screen, wmartin at mountoliveJoliet.org. Just say, I want to be saved. If you're watching and worshiping with us today, you don't have a church home. Maybe you recently moved to this area and you have yet to find a church home. Or maybe you have a church home, but you're not quite growing where you're going. I'd love to be your pastor. All these folks watching and worshiping this morning would love to be your church family. Leave us a message in that comment section. Shoot me an email. Say, I want to be a member of Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church. You can be saved. You don't have to join this church. Or you can get saved and you can join this church. Whatever the case may be. You can join this church if you're already saved. Whatever the case may be. And then thirdly, if you want to rededicate your life to Christ, maybe you established a relationship with Jesus Christ some time ago, but you haven't been walking this thing out. You say, hey, I want to rededicate my life Christ. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. As a matter of fact, pray this prayer with me. Just say this, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and that you rose for my justification. Forgive me of my sin. I turn away from them now. I confess that you are my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, you are saved. And your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you were to leave this earth right now, you would spend an eternity with Jesus Christ after you die. Shoot me an email. Let me know that you gave your life to Christ this morning. I want to connect with you. I want to get some materials in your hand to help you with your new life in Christ. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise for anybody watching that may have given their life to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You all know that it's first Sunday here at Mount Olive and, well, first Sunday everywhere. And at uh, first Sunday, we um, engage in one of our two ordinances that we observe as a church. And that ordinance is the ordinance of communion. Two of the ordinances that we observe are baptism and communion, where we get a chance to reflect on what God did by sending Jesus Christ to die for our sins how appropriate that our message today is on that good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we get a chance to celebrate the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So you should have already gotten your elements by this time. Uh, we posted it earlier on in the broadcast. We encourage you all. We'll give you a few seconds if you still haven't grabbed
your cracker, your juice, whatever the case may be. If you got some uh, some Keebler elves, whatever you got in the pantry, in the closet, or in the bread box, and go grab you some crackers and grab you some juice. Um, this ain't time for you to try to get lit. Some of y'all trying to go grab that strong stuff. The game gonna come on for a little while, so uh, don't don't get started too early. But grab you some juice and a cracker. your voices. One more time, lift your voice and sing. It reaches to the highest mountain. Never 
come on and sing it one more time. It will never leave. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Go ahead and lift your cracker, whatever you have. Father in heaven, we thank you. We give you praise. We bless this communion now. It represents the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Forgive us of our sins. Purify us of our wrong. We want to be right before you. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. The body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take and eat all of it. the same manner, the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us take and drink our life. Now if you're thankful for what God did by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins, why don't you lift your voice, put those hands together and give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Come on, lift those voices and put those hands together and give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift your voice and just sing it one more time. Say, it'll never lose its power. Come on, lift your voice and say, say, it'll never lose, never lose its power. Come on, lift those voices and say, it will never lose, never lose its power. Hallelujah. Say, it will celebrate the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, thank you all for watching and worshiping with us this morning. We give God praise for each and every one of you. Again, we are starting a new teaching and preaching series entitled The DNA of a Healthy Church. And over the next five weeks uh, on Sundays and on Wednesdays, I will be preaching and I will be teaching on the DNA of a healthy church. What are those essentials that make a church healthy? Whether you're an individual who's been in church most of your life and you've never been taught from scripture what a healthy church looks like. We're going to be going over that for the next five weeks. I encourage all of our leaders, especially all of our leaders, to make sure that you're logged on and watching us on Sundays. Make sure you're logged on and engaging with us in Bible study on Wednesdays as we dig deep into scripture. I know a lot of people have opinions about what a healthy church looks like, but however, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, our opinions should be subject to the word of God. So we're going to be looking to the word of God to see what a healthy church looks like. We're going to be talking about biblical leadership. We'll be talking about, like today, we talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about a biblical perspective of conversion. We're going to be talking about evangelism and what healthy churches look like as it relates to evangelism. We'll go over a few things over the next five weeks as we deal with the DNA of a healthy church. Amen. Listen, thank you all for your continued commitment to giving. We love you and we appreciate you upholding this ministry and supporting this ministry financially. Again, if you want to give this morning, there are five ways you can give. All five ways are on your screen. Uh, you can give via Dropbox. You can give by mail. You can text any dollar amount to 84321. You can give online at mindologyjoliet.org or you can take advantage of the Church Center app located in both the Apple App Store and the Google Play App Store. You can download that Church Center app through that app, but you can also manage your member profile so that we have the most up-to-date information uh, for each and every one of you all. Again, thank you for your commitment to giving. Thank you for your commitment to watching and worshiping with us until the Lord allows us to assemble together in person. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. I've never seen a storm cloud that did not eventually pass. Let me say that again.
access to the word as you just got to hold on and see what the Lord is going to do. Hallelujah. Let's pray. We're going to bless this offering and we're going to dismiss at the same time. Father in heaven, we thank you. We give you praise. We honor you for your word. Thank you for giving us good news for bad times. I pray that you will bless these gifts that shall be given. Bless the givers, Lord. Let these gifts be used for the advancement of your kingdom. And now, God, dismiss us from this virtual space, but not from your presence. In the mighty, matchless, and magnificent name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah and amen. I love you all. Y'all have a fantastic week. Amen.